Good evening. I'm Teresa Knott, VCU's Interim Dean of Libraries and University Librarian. Thank you for joining us tonight for our 20th Annual Black History Lecture. A 20th anniversary is a significant milestone, and we are delighted that you joined us for the occasion. The Black History Lecture was created to celebrate the history and societal impact of Black Americans and to examine persistent issues such as discrimination, disparities, and racism. It is underwritten by the Francis M. Foster African American History Endowment and the Friends of VCU Libraries. I hope that you will consider joining the Friends of Library or contributing to the Foster Endowment to support this and other programs. While the world changed dramatically in the last 20 years, it is clear that many challenges remain as we strive toward a more socially and racially just society for VCU, the Commonwealth in the United States. Events of the last year certainly illustrated that despite making progress, the struggle for justice remains. During tonight's event, if you have any questions, please use the chat or the Zoom Q&A feature to share them with our behind the scenes moderator. After the speaker's presentation, we'll shift to audience questions. Gregory Kimbrell will be monitoring the chat throughout the event. And if you have any technical difficulties, please let him know. He's gonna share his contact information in the chat feature. Now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our 20th annual Black History Lecture speaker, Marsha Chatelaine. Dr. Chatelaine is a history professor, excuse me, professor of history in African American studies at Georgetown University. She is a native of Chicago. She received her BA in journalism and religious studies from St. Ignatius College Prep at the University of Missouri Columbia and her AM and PhD in American Civilization from Brown University. She has received numerous honors and most recently was named a 2019 Andrew Carnegie Fellow. Her first book, Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration, reimagines the mass exodus of Black Southerners to the urban North from the perspective of girls and teenage women. Her latest book is Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. You'll find more information about the book in the chat. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Chatelain to VCU. Thank you so much, um, Teresa, and thank you for um, to all the folks at the VCU Libraries for um, making this event happen. Uh, franchise came out in January of 2020 and enjoyed about um, six weeks of a book tour before things started to shut down. And so I'm just always really heartened that we've been able to move engagements like this into the virtual space and to have such great turnout and to perhaps have people who wouldn't otherwise be able to uh, go out for the evening and talk about books and talk about ideas to participate. So this is a real um, pleasure and this is a real um, privilege and I'm so grateful for it. And I'm also incredibly grateful for the opportunity to celebrate Black History Month with the VCU community. I think that as our nation um, makes the choice to tell more nuanced and rich stories about the past, our ability to see ourselves and the experiences of people in eras that have um, gone by, I think is such an incredible um, opportunity. And so I hope Franchise uh, provides a little bit of insight into the recent past. So at this time, I'm gonna do like I do when I teach my classes, I'm gonna share my screen um, and present briefly on Franchise and then open up questions that you may have about how you write a book about McDonald's without getting access to the corporate archives. What does McDonald's mean to communities in the 21st century and the various experiences that you've had of McDonald's in your own life and your own world. Um, over the course of this book tour, I have encountered only one person who said that they have never been to McDonald's. And um, this was a topic of curiosity for many members of the audience. And he said that he was raised by two vegan chefs and they never ate McDonald's. And so I love to hear McDonald's stories, whether you enjoy it or not. So the story of McDonald's and Black America for me begins with this man. Um, you may 
uh, find that he's a familiar face. For those of you who do not know, he is Bill Clinton. He's a former president of the United States. And when he ran for office in 1992, uh, for those of us of a certain age, we remember the various ways that Bill Clinton was perceived by the national media. Um, he was rather young, uh, governor of Arkansas, who then ran for president. Um, he was part of a generation that was emerging as leaders of the nation. He was someone who enjoyed McDonald's and he very much represented um, this generation that came of age in mid-century in the 1960s. And Bill Clinton's affinity for McDonald's often made him the target of ridicule. And some of you may remember that Saturday Night Live, the late comedian Phil Hartman would do a bit where he was uh, Bill Clinton on the campaign trail and he would sit and talk to everyday Americans about their concerns and he would sneak and eat their French fries in the process. So Bill Clinton and McDonald's is a curious topic for me because I often reflected on the ways that um, Toni Morrison's characterization of Bill Clinton as America's first Black president um, reemerged in the 2008 presidential campaign when the nation actually elected its first Black president. And when people would return to that quote, Toni Morrison called Bill Clinton the nation's first black president, they often failed to reference the article in which Toni Morrison wrote this. She wrote this for the talk of the town section of the New Yorker in 1998. And what she was talking about was the fact that the way that Congress had pursued Bill Clinton during his impeachment trial reminded her of the ways that African-Americans were often pursued by the criminal justice system. But this passage has always been a topic of fascination for me. Morrison wrote, after all, Clinton displays almost every trope of blackness, single parent household, born poor, working class, saxophone playing, McDonald's and junk food loving boy from Arkansas. This is always something that I find interesting. Although we know that fast food is eaten by people of all races and eaten all over the world, what McDonald's and what fast food has meant to African-American communities, I think is particularly distinct and opens up conversations about the nature of race and food and justice. And so moving away from Bill Clinton's blackness, I was also in the process of conducting this research moved by images like this. This is Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. This is the McDonald's on Florescent Avenue where many different people, actors in the drama that was Ferguson, Missouri in August of 2014 often converged. This is a McDonald's that is operated by an African-American franchise owner. It was the site of um, confrontations between the police and journalists like Wesley Laurie, who was actually arrested at this McDonald's. It was the site of many shift changes among officers and National Guardsmen. Um, this was also a place in which protesters um, would use the facilities. One night, a group of protesters um, stormed the McDonald's because they had been tear gassed and they were looking for milk to relieve their stings. This McDonald's um, was written about quite a bit after things quieted down in Ferguson, Missouri. And part of the analysis was that despite people's kind of mixed or negative feelings about fast food, this McDonald's was like a beacon in a time of unrest. And as someone, again, who's been immersed in research about McDonald's and African-American uh, communities, I thought about this McDonald's and I thought about scenes like this. This is a picture of Washington, DC in 1968 after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And in fact, the scene in Ferguson, the ways that a black franchised McDonald's stood as a pillar in a predominantly black part of a city is very much connected to this moment in Washington DC in 1968 when the death of Martin Luther King Jr. opened up a space to ask questions about racial and economic justice and the fast food industry saw an opportunity to enter into neighborhoods that they had previously ignored. In order to understand the story that I tell in Franchise, there's a little bit of background information you need to know. Uh, some of you may own your own franchises, but franchising, in my opinion, is one of the most American kinds of business because franchising success is not contingent upon having an advanced degree in business or some specialized knowledge. 
but compliance to the rules of the franchise agreement is often presented as all you need in order to be successful. There are about 760,000 franchise style businesses in the United States. They include hotels and daycare centers, elder care centers, um, muffler shops, as well as copy centers. But most people understand franchises in terms of the fast food industry. And there are about a quarter of a million fast food restaurants in the United States. And so franchising is essentially a relationship about the right to operate a certain type of business. In the book, I describe it as a parent-child relationship in which the parent sets all the rules, but the child makes all the money. And the reason why franchises are, I think, in many ways, very American is that they present the idea that anyone can be successful if they just try very hard. But franchising can be really tough, particularly in the food industry. And franchises often have to assume the liabilities and all of the risks of doing business without the support of the franchisor. And we'll return to this when we look at the contemporary moment, particularly the recent lawsuits um, involved Involving African American franchise owners of McDonald's and the McDonald's Corporation. But first, the book. So, one of the things that I sought out in writing franchise is to tell a different story about the rise of McDonald's that doesn't um, fall into kind of two tropes that we see in business history. One, the celebration of innovation, which is very much part of the fast food industry, or um, suggesting that. There were special gifts in the McDonald's brothers and later Ray Kroc, who became the head of McDonald's and created the franchising system that we have today. Some of you may have seen the movie with Michael Keaton, the founder, where uh, Ray Kroc is, um, he's painted like kind of an evil genius that um, has put his entire heart into creating McDonald's. But these narratives often leave out an important component to understanding the history of business, as well as the rise of capitalism in the United States. And that is that these systems are predicated on the exclusion and exploitation of African Americans. So all of the elements that make McDonald's possible in mid-century America, the rise of car culture, the expansion of the highway system, the creation of suburban bedroom communities where upwardly mobile families can afford to take their children to McDonald's, the marketing of products to children directly via television, the um, accessibility of travel for um, people who want to use the highways and stop at a McDonald's as a rest stop. All of these different systems um, excluded African Americans or exploited them in different ways. So I talk about the founding of McDonald's as a story about race in America. And I look at the community of San Bernardino where the original McDonald's um, grew and flourished as this very successful business. And I talk about the experiences of African Americans in San Bernardino and Southern California so that we shift our lens of how we understand these iconic American institutions. The first chapter also recognizes the fact that McDonald's was a target of desegregation efforts on the part of civil rights groups like the NAACP, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Congress of Racial Equality. When we think about the story of desegregation of public accommodations in the United States, we often think of pictures of protesters at Woolworth's drugs or Woolworth's counters or Katz's drugs, brands that are no longer with us. McDonald's is part of that story. And I found it particularly curious the ways that McDonald's does not appear as part of the narrative of the fight for civil rights. And in telling that story, I was able to um, share the stories of protesters who were um, objects and, and targets of violence in places like Pine Bluff, Arkansas, in um, Durham, North Carolina, as well as Memphis, Tennessee. And so in grounding McDonald's relative to the racial history of the United States in the 40s and 1950s and 60s, I introduced the ways that McDonald's became um, 
more present and more pronounced in Black communities. And this happens after moments that um, are captured here in this photograph. This is a picture of a street in Chicago after King's assassination. And you see the sign in the window that says Soul Brother. It was a sign to indicate that this was a Black owned business in hopes that it would prevent that business from being a target of people who were frustrated and angry at what they saw as economic exploitation in Black neighborhoods. But this era of Black capitalism was one in which, after the death of King, major civil rights organizations had to make a de decision about how they were going to pivot. Were they going to continue King's work on anti-poverty and anti-war that had come together in his proposal for a poor people's campaign on Washington, a national march on Washington to demand that the nation create policies to take care of its most vulnerable? Would the civil rights movement continue to press the issue of fair housing, an issue that um, disappointed Dr. King when he brought his movement to Chicago in the late 1960s? Or was the pivot going to be towards building Black economic um, opportunity through businesses and through the um, accumulation of capital. And these were ideas that were starting to sprout from people like Jesse Jackson, who left uh, Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference to start Operation Breadbasket, which then became um, which became PUSH, People United to Save Humanity. How was this new era of civil rights going to interact with the Nixon administration, which had not been a friend of civil rights, but had supported a program of black capitalism, which essentially said that they were willing to put federal resources and coordinate bank resources and private foundation resources in building black economic strength. And so in this climate, McDonald's emerges. And what McDonald's realizes is that there's a potential for um, subsidies to Black franchise owners who are creating minority businesses through the Office of Economic Opportunity. There is also a market that is demanding that they want to patronize uh, Black-owned businesses. And there is also an environment in which some white franchise owners who were, doing, who were previously doing businesses in communities that were changing demographically along racial lines or who found themselves doing businesses um, with a Black clientele who no longer wanted to do business in those communities. And so after this period of time, McDonald's allows that cohort to leave the city and go to the suburbs. And in their place came African-American franchise owners like the ones like the one memorialized here on a McDonald's in the south side of Chicago, um, Herman Petty, who reopened an abandoned store in December 21st, 1968. And this is no coincidence that this store reopens as black owned um, uh, eight months after King's assassination. And the African-American press really celebrated the entry of black franchise owners into the system. Um, Herman Petty is at the center of this photograph. He is the first black franchise owner um, and he is flanked by um, Leonard Bennett and Willie Wilson. If there are any Chicagoans in the audience, you will know the significance of Willie Wilson who runs for president every four years and is a colorful character in the local Chicago community. But this, original group of black franchise owners were considered, you know, incredibly influential. And they were one of um, the markers of some type of progress after the devastations of the loss of Dr. King and then the loss of Robert Kennedy and the election of um, Richard Nixon. And so I say this to say that it is important for us to recognize the power of this type of symbolic representation, even if it is in something that we um, see as everyday or unspecial as a McDonald's. By the vantage point of 1968, it is a very big deal for African Americans, particularly it's all men at this point, to be able to be engaged in this type of business. So after I introduce um, readers to this early group of African American franchise owners, I look at some micro histories and I look at um, the slow creep of McDonald's into black neighborhoods. 
moving away from Chicago, where McDonald's was very much welcomed by African American communities, to a conflict in Cleveland, Ohio, that involved um, the first black mayor of Cleveland and um, a man who's often credited as being the first black mayor of a major US city, um, Carl Stokes. And so while Carl Stokes is preparing for um, a reelection uh, campaign, he finds himself at the center of a major boycott in the city. And the boycott pivots around McDonald's and African Americans. And it's not like the boycotts of the early 1960s where African Americans are gathering so they can be accommodated at a McDonald's, so they can be served. This isn't the issue, they're being served. And they're actually a very profitable consumer base for these McDonald's locations, but they're not franchised by black people. They're franchised by white businessmen. And this creates a lot of consternation in the community. There is a lot of drama in this chapter. There is a homicide that some people are believed is tied to an African-American man's bid to try to get a McDonald's. There is a charismatic leader who later um, flees to Guyana during the era of Jonestown and the People's Temple settling there who galvanizes this group, this umbrella group called Operation Black Unity. And they boycott McDonald's quite successfully and they get the mayor involved and they get McDonald's corporate involved. And the central question is who is going to determine how McDonald's operates within the context of black communities? How are they going to give back in terms of philanthropy, subsidies to the community, and who gets to control that ownership? And it really highlights just how high stakes and how important these franchises were emerging in this period of time where McDonald's wasn't the national and global brand that we understand today. Um, some of the groups um, that were part of Operation uh, Black Unity included this youth group Afroset that would um, participate in the boycotts and they would have these kind of um, uh, militaristic or martial arts kind of demonstration. And I think that this question of how McDonald's appears on the local level was one of the most, um, it was kind of the fa most fascinating parts of the research process because there isn't one story, context matters. And that's why in chapter four, I look at various groups that are pushing back against the influence of McDonald's and community. Um, chapter four looks at uh, Portland, Oregon and the accusation that um, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense has bombed a McDonald's because they refused to participate in the free breakfast program for children and the ways that um, FBI surveillance and um, perhaps some agent provocateurs get involved in the situation. Um, Kent Ford, who's pictured here at a breakfast program, you know, said, and he's still with us today, and he's an activist who continues to work on racial justice issues in the Northeast, says, you know, we had no interest in bombing this McDonald's, right? Like this was, this made no sense. But these conflicts were so real in people's lives, and they really show, um, I think, the last moments of a an attempt to think of Black self-determination and Black economic possibility within communities and outside of the kind of structures that were put in place by corporations and the federal government's um, determination that Black business should look one way. Um, some of the other struggles that I chronicle are in Philadelphia, where members of the Ogans Neighborhood Association are trying to fight the building of a new McDonald's, and they use a number of arguments, including community control. They say that the money that this franchise owner has put up for McDonald's is tied to organized crime. They make a case for resisting McDonald's by saying, we're not anti-fast food, but we are living in a world in which because we are poor, because we are working class, because we are black, we are not able to attract the things our communities need. And I think that this conflict really emphasizes something that I wanted to write about in this book. And it's the fact that business and the private sector can never fully address the very real um, issues of racial and economic justice. That This is a public sphere issue that has to be put in the hands of the people. Um, another approach to bending the golden arches was celebrity brands. African-American celebrities got into the business of competitive franchise restaurants that they argued were more authentically Black than McDonald's and the other legacy brands, and that 
could be used as a vehicle for community development. In Chicago, as well as Cleveland, some people used McDonald's restaurants as kind of community development groups um, to either do youth jobs and empowerment or try to reinvest some of the profits into the communities. And Muhammad Ali's Champ Burger said that they could do it better. Um, Mahalia Jackson's Glory Fried Chicken um, also um, presented itself as a tool of economic development for African-American communities. The curious thing about both of these companies is that they were actually not owned by the celebrities who leased their names to them. And if you're interested in that story, um, in the chat, I can drop a link to um, a podcast that I did for um, America's Test Kitchen. Their podcast is called Proof, and it was about um, these chains and what happens when they um, try to compete with McDonald's in the 1970s. The latter half of the book um, looks at some of the ways that McDonald's influences African Americans outside of the confines of just food. And so I look at the cultural work of McDonald's in African American communities because so much about McDonald's success is about their knack for advertising. And so I look at the emergence of advertisement that was targeted towards African Americans, which was one of the key interventions of the National Black McDonald's Operators Association. They argued to McDonald's that a portion of their profits were going into a general advertising pool, but advertising that McDonald's was um, contracting was not reaching African Americans. They weren't using um, African American magazines and newspapers. They weren't using um, black radio stations or television programs to promote McDonald's. And so with the work of the iconic um, advertising ag agency, Burrell Communications, as well as other marketing firms, they created this advertisement um, to really speak to black America. I also argue that McDonald's was among one of the first corporations to take seriously the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Um, for those of us old enough to remember the passage of the holiday, it was incredibly controversial because Martin Luther King Jr., as we understand him today as a hero of the past, is a relatively new creation that has taken about um, two to three decades um, to emerge. Um, even in the early 1980s, when Ronald Reagan signed the legislation for the federal holiday, people said that Martin Luther King Jr. was a communist, that he didn't care about America. Arguments were made by people like Strom Thurmond that if someone was going to get a holiday, it should be Frederick Douglass, not Martin Luther King Jr., um, which really kind of reflects his knowledge of history. Um, but all of this is to say that McDonald's supporting the King holiday is a reflection of the influence of Black franchise owners who are incredibly successful in their local communities in um, not only uh, generating profits, but being kind of a force for philanthropy. Um, they really, I think, were a big factor in the early King years, King holiday years. And then there's a continued work on the fast food industry to underwrite and support Black cultural forms like uh, gospel music, um, the popularization of Double Dutch um, with the All-American Double Dutch team, which later appeared in a McDonald's commercial, as well as um, the support for the All-American basketball game, which in the years before YouTube and social media were really important for African-American athletes to get exposure to uh, recruiters for college. And so the last two chapters look at some of the contemporary dilemmas associated with McDonald's and Black America. The first was, um, the first that I introduce is a lawsuit on behalf of a man named Charles Griffiths, who claims that McDonald's has essentially limited his opportunity by not allowing him to have franchise stores in suburban or more affluent or white communities. And this conflict about whether McDonald's is redlining or confining Black franchise owners to just Black neighborhoods opens up this conversation about opportunity. 
What does it mean for African Americans to have the opportunity to franchise a McDonald's, but still feel the weight of racial limitations? And this is an issue that civil rights organizations like the NAACP, like uh, Jesse Jackson, who's pictured here as the head of Operation Push. And if you look very closely, right behind him is Al Sharpton um, in the 80s. He looks very different now. Um, the head of the National Action Network. And the National Na Action Network, the NAACP and Operation Push, often facilitated um, agreements between corporations and aggrieved parties, aggrieved African Americans. And so when these high profile events would happen, there would be some type of negotiation which would lead to um, the granting of more minority owned stores, opportunities for black banks and black attorneys. And one of the things I argue that as a result of these agreements, often called fair share agreements, is that while it responded to the immediate desire to see African Americans um, enter franchising and enter corporate um, America at greater numbers, it left behind the critical mass of African Americans who were vulnerable through low wage jobs and were vulnerable to the hypersaturation of fast food within their communities. And the Black McDonald's Operators Association has um, spent most of its history in these kind of back and forth exchanges with McDonald's over whether or not there is equal opportunity within that system. And finally, the last chapter um, starts with um, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book. And it's an event I call the Miracle of the Golden Arches. And this is a picture of McDonald's um, in South Los Angeles in 1992. After the acquittal of the police officers who beat Rodney King in 1992 in Los Angeles, um, the Los Angeles uprisings um, erupted over the course of a week. And at the end of this incredibly chaotic time in Southern California, then CEO of McDonald's, Ed Renzi, issued a press release that said, no McDonald's restaurant was harmed during the unrest. And this is a reflection of our socially progressive policies that started in the late 1960s and essentially argued that McDonald's was part of the black community. And because it was such a familiar and positive force in the black community, it had been um, sheltered from the animus and the rage and the grief that people felt during this time. And I thought, what a bizarre statement. Um, and I tried my hardest, I went to the archives, which everyone um, should do when they have a question um, at the University of Southern California. And I read a lot of the reports that came out of the commission and it wasn't really clear if this was a true statement or not, but it was irrelevant if it was true. McDonald's had established itself as um, close to, in contact, in close proximity to, ingratiated to Black America because of this history. And unrest is at kind of every single moment where McDonald's is making a statement about its relationship to African Americans. And I think that these types of bonds, um, although they come from corporate entities and communities, are really important to analyze. And I think that they return to a point that I made earlier about the dangers of thinking that um, businesses can solve the complex problems of racial injustice. And so today we find ourselves thinking about fast food in a number of different ways. Often when I say that I write about race and fast food, people often think about um, the health disparities of like obesity and hypertension that has acutely um, impacted communities of color. And we think about uh, the former first lady and her attempt to try to improve the quality of uh, child nutrition and health. We also think about um, the, the um, continued labor strikes or the labor movement um, around the fight for 15 and wages um, for uh, fast food workers. And I think that in order for us to really craft smart and thoughtful and um, sensitive public policy responses to these issues, we have to be grounded in the nuance and rich history of McDonald's and African American communities in order to understand that fast food is not just about our desire to eat. Fast food in the consumer marketplace is about belonging. It's about a kind of inclusion that on one hand can serve 
one set of needs while also starving you of others. And so most recently, um, I had the opportunity to write a new preface for Franchise when it was re-released a few weeks ago in paperback. And writing um, this introduction uh, with the backdrop of our George Floyd summer and thinking about what does it mean for the CEO of McDonald's to um, create a social media post that say Black Lives Matter and to gesture towards, um, you know, uh, its philanthropy for the NAACP and other programs, and to know that we've been here before. And the question is, when we know this history, what are we going to imagine differently for the future? And with that, I'll stop scare sharing my screen, and I can't wait to hear um, your questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chattel, and that was wonderful. So while Gregory tees up some questions, I'm gonna jump in and ask one. I was, it made my librarian heart happy to see all the primary source material and things from the archives. So where did you predominantly do your research? What, which libraries or archives were, were, were most helpful to you? Everywhere. I mean, you know, one of the things that happens when you write a corporate history is you, you know, you call the company and you say, hey, you know, what do you got for me? And McDonald's has an archivist and they have incredible collections that are just not open to the public. And I think for many, um, you know, researchers, sometimes we say, okay, the first no, we don't know if we can do these projects. But what was amazing is when I focused on McDonald's and African American communities, the archive was so rich that I, I could have written 10 books. I really could have. Um, I'm glad I only had to write one. So um, my research took me all over and I'm really grateful that I was able to travel during that time. Um, Portland, Oregon, um, because of this conflict between the Black Panther Party and McDonald's had incredible resources about McDonald's. And this picture that's on the cover of this beautiful cover um, that was done um, at Norton. This is in Portland. This is the McDonald's where the bombing happened. And after kind of a peaceful resolution, they used that McDonald's for voter registration. And I couldn't think of a better symbol of this weird intersection of one's rights and the marketplace. Um, the collections of black mayors, of the first black mayors, there's tons of stuff about McDonald's because these men are, often running on a broad racial justice platform that's very pro-business. And so um, uh, Ed, uh, Tom Bradley at UCLA, um, his papers had all sorts of stuff about McDonald's and the 84 Olympics. Um, the papers of um, Mayor Carl Stokes in Cleveland. Um, the, I think most curious archives, I could talk about archives all day, um, was um, Julian Bond. And when we think of Congressman, uh, you know, Julian Bond, he's the elder statesman of Black America. He franchised a Dairy Queen with some friends from the civil rights movement. Wow. And so he, his papers at the University of Virginia have all sorts of rich ideas about um, franchising. And then all of the major civil rights organizations to this day have deep relationships with franchising. And so the papers of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Atlanta are filled with information about McDonald's. Wow. Thank you. Now I'm going to hand it over to Gregory. Thank you so much, Teresa, for having our icebreaker question. And I'm looking through questions that we've received in the, um, in the Q&A, and they're all over the place. So I'm going to start with a question that I think sort of encapsulates that, which is, when you discuss this topic with your students, do you find it leading to other conversations? Absolutely. Um, you know, the conversation that I want our students to think about is what do we mean by the public sphere? We are in an era in which um, I think there's such a, a negative view of government for a number of reasons. Um, there's a sense that in order for processes to unfold, that there has to be corporate underwriting, there has to be private foundations. And you know, these are elements of our society that exist, but I always wanna say, well, what do we have as people? Where, do our, where does our power come from? Does our power come from our ability to get a donor base? Does our power come as consumers, as people who buy things? Does our power come from members, uh, being members of the community? And so, you know, most of my students live in a world where McDonald's has always been a presence, right? There isn't a world without McDonald's. And I wanted them to sometimes imagine a world without 
Facebook or world without the internet or world without um, fast food as it exists today and that it could have represented other things to people in an earlier period? So I have, again, a, a whole panoply of questions here. Here's one about um, food deserts and the intersection of, of the fast food franchise industry and those. Do you have any thoughts on um, just food deserts in general and how, how fast food plays into eliminating them or creating them or? You know, I think when we talk about um, food deserts, we often talk about communities in which people have to travel more than a mile to get fresh groceries. Um, but I think sometimes um, the question of why don't certain communities have more um, grocery stores um, leads us into this question about policy. So um, the period of time that I'm looking at, the federal subsidies for fast food are incredibly rich. And supermarkets are not considered small businesses, but fast food franchises are. So you already see the incentives for fast food. But one of the things I, I want us to be really careful about sometimes is when we talk about um, food deserts and you know people just need fresh food, we have to think about what food does in a context. And so access to uh, fresh food is only as valuable as access to refrigeration and um, access to a heating and cooking source and access to time to prepare food and access to all of the different things that we need for a healthy life. I think it is very um, easy for us to say, okay, if people just could afford better groceries and make different nutritional choices, everything would be fine. It would be, but it has to happen within a context where the totality of justice is possible. Because fast food is sometimes the most rational choice you can make. If you work multiple jobs and you have 20 minutes to eat and you have $6, Filling up on a Big Mac and fries makes perfect sense. And I think what happens is that, um, you know, when we talk about food deserts, we also talk about food apartheid, right? Like the things in which people are, are, are separated, not just in what they can consume, but their ability to um, mediate the consequences of their diets, either through access to healthcare or even time. And then here's a question on a completely other spectrum. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the gender dynamics involving McDonald's franchises? Yes, thank you for that question. So um, there's a lot of men in this book. And as someone who is trained in women's history, I thought to myself, you know, like, what am I doing here? Um, but gender is a large part of this story because a lot of the idea of um, creating one's own business, having control over one's economic destin destiny, there's a very, um, it's, it's tied into ideas of masculinity and patriarchy. And that really comes out in the lawsuit I talk about from the early 1980s, where this African American man has um, McDonald's restaurants in South Los Angeles. And his wife tries to um, franchise a Popeye's chicken and biscuits. And McDonald's says, you can't do that. Your spouse can't be involved in a, comp a, comp a competing brand. And his retort is, how dare you tell a man what can happen in his household? And what it's doing, it's conjuring up this ideas of autonomy. And when you look at both race and gender together, these arguments that um, African Americans are making about McDonald's is, you know, you're trying to replicate some of the dynamics of the old South where you control me and you control my household. We are not going to stand for it. Um, the other element of that is that, um, you know, these are really hard businesses to get into and maintain. And so there's this idea of being a McDonald's family. There's this idea of women who own McDonald's independent of husbands are very proud of it. They say that I did not marry into this. I earned it myself. So there's all of these different ways about economic power that are kind of filtered through the lens of where people fit within the franchise community. And then we have another question on a completely other subject. Uh huh. Um, one of our board members says it would be easy to paint McDonald's as a clear villain, as it often is in the media, but you're very even handed in the way you discuss it. Was it hard to walk that line? 
You know, it's it's funny. I, I thank you for that analysis because you know my goal is not to write a takedown book of McDonald's. There's so many of them, and they're very good, right? Um, books like Fast Food Nation and you know film like Super Size Me really kind of gets McDonald's. What I wanted was to be very aware of the limited choices that African African American communities have to make each and every day and what choices people had presented for them in 1968 and how some of those choices didn't really change in 88 or 2008, right? Like I wanna be really sensitive because one of the dangers I think in research about race and fast food is to start to castigate people about the way they eat or the way they feed their children in their communities. I'm not particularly interested in that. I'm interested in the ways that we turn to the marketplace um, to solve problems that are are more structural and rooted in our arrangements in society. Um, thank you for, I thought I was just, you know, I thought it was very even with McDonald's. Um, McDonald's and I aren't the best of friends, but I recognize that because it has different meetings and different communities, that I have to take that seriously and respect the fact that McDonald's means something to communities because of the choices that they had. And it may not mean the same thing to me because of the privileges I have. So this sort of leads into another question that we have, which is what was your, your inspiration behind this book or what motivated you to take on this topic? You know, I'm very much um, a child of the 80s and I was part of the generation where it wasn't a big deal to eat McDonald's all the time. Um, you know, I remember C. Everett Koop, who was then the Surgeon General during the Reagan administration, you know, talking about cholesterol for the first time. And so people my age grew up eating like no eggs, but we ate like lots of carbs. And it was like before bread was a bad thing. So we ate just, we never ate white bread, but we, you know, we ate a lot of whole wheat bagels. I feel like I emerged, um, my sensibilities as an eater emerged during a very interesting time in American food history. And I say this because um, as I got older and I got more educated, the kind of contemptuous ways in which people talked about fast food were really fascinating. Um, and I think that some elements of the food justice movement in their castigation of people who consume fast food are often um, kind of um, unintentionally or sometimes intentionally using judgment about food to be markers of some very kind of racially demeaning um, characterizations. And that made me very uncomfortable. And so I wanted to think to myself, if I was going to talk to the food justice community about history, what do they need to understand about these affective bonds that McDonald's has in certain communities in order to think about their interventions around health and nutrition? We also have an, an interesting question about, um, about your research process. And did you find that, that materials that you were dealing with uh, had a certain spin? Did you have to overcome, uh, you know, sort of like corporate talk from McDonald's about their, their value to the community? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, some of the kind of corporate talk about their value to community was captured in like the press releases and the news articles that were a response to um, conflict. But in the papers of like, for instance, when the NAACP gets involved in some of these lawsuits or, you know, um, you know, Jesse Jackson is writing a letter to McDonald's saying, you know, we're gonna investigate discrimination and the assignment of franchises. McDonald's response also evolves, I think, with our ideas of corporate diversity talk, because in the 1980s, when they're challenged um, by this idea that they're redlining and excluding African Americans, they say things like, but we're giving you a great opportunity. Like, why are you complaining? I mean, no one would, no one would respond in that way today, but it's this really kind of kind of sharp, like how dare you, you know, not think of us as, as being great. And that changes over time. So I think that the parts of the research that are hard or the hardest are ones that involved um, criminal complaints and allegations um, because for instance, if you look at the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, we know that they were pursued by, you know, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. So when I read a report that says, you know, um, that the Black Panther Party bombed a McDonald's, I have to read that document with the understanding of the types of work that was being done to discredit this group and community and, you know, tread from that perspective. We have a couple of questions also that relate to 
uh, sort of current practices in McDonald's and how McDonald's presents itself as uh, an excellent uh, advancement opportunity for employees. Has this, has this changed in recent years or is this a, a, an issue that still is a problem or is this a, a perception that people have? Yeah, so, um, you know, I talk about the iconic um, Calvin ads of the 1990s that are trying to tell a narrative that McDonald's is good for Black America because, you know, they provide jobs in the inner city and, you know, they kind of save African American youth from themselves. But the one thing that I think is really interesting, this narrative that you can be a cashier and then work your way up to becoming a franchise owner is incredibly difficult to do and is so rare and really um, obscures the amount of capital and social and economic capital you need to have. But this idea that this is America's best first job um, was something that they promoted throughout um, the 70s and 80s, particularly among African Americans. I'm going to very quickly show you this. I'm going to share my screen one more time um, to show you this ad because I think it really captures um, the ways um, that McDonald's promoted itself to black communities. You see that there's these two ads that say, you know, who's one of the largest contributors, contributors to United Negro Fund? Who's the largest employer of black America? If this is a burger company, why are these two facts so important? And it's this idea that McDonald's is invested in kind of the economic um, growth of African Americans. But I think in recent years, when McDonald's is engaged in the kind of racial reckoning it was engaged in in 2020, a lot of those efforts are concentrated among people who are in the white collar C-suite position or suppliers or franchisees. And I argue that it often leaves behind um, substantive changes for the life of workers. And I think that this has always been part of the problem. We have time for perhaps a couple of final questions. There have been several questions related to um, different regions in which McDonald's appears and different countries too. Many people have wondered if uh, McDonald's has played a similar role in other countries and if McDonald's has played different roles within our own country in different regions. This is a great question. So one of the uh, markers often of affluence in the United States in your a community is if you've kept McDonald's out. And this is what I thought was really interesting about the 70s, these working class black communities that are making environmental and social arguments against McDonald's to keep McDonald's out, they lose very quickly. And then affluent communities like Martha's Vineyard or West Palm Beach, they are trying to make arguments about kind of quality of life. And now the affluence of a community isn't determined by not having McDonald's. It's just how much it doesn't look like a McDonald's. So, you know, does your McDonald's look like a ski chalet? Um, you know, does it have kind of muted tones? That's how you know about the power and the um, wealth of a community. Um, so some of these, uh, so some communities are more open to McDonald's than others. Chicago, I think, has the hometown advantage. Um, some franchise owners say it's very hard for African Americans in the South to kind of uh, access McDonald's for a long period of time. Um, you know, globally um, overseas, McDonald's does not have the same exact franchising model. Um, some of those global um, locations are um, company owned. But one of the reasons why when you go on vacation and you go to a McDonald's and all the food tastes different is that McDonald's has to um, comply with local laws on food quality and food safety. And this is why the food tastes better overseas. And it doesn't have the same connotation as kind of cheap food. It's usually more expensive because of various um, levies that are put on it as a foreign product. And it's usually considered um, a marker of middle class or upper class status that one can afford it. McDonald's. I think maybe one final question. What was your favorite part of writing this book? Oh my gosh. You know, it's it, my favorite part of writing this book is um, the, the, the people you meet along the way who have these McDonald's, these hidden McDonald's stories. Um, when I was on my first book tour um, before COVID, um, in Kansas City, a woman um, told me this story about how she remembers like the first time she went on a date to a McDonald's and had ice cream. And she remembers this because she grew up in the Jim Crow South and her grandmother wouldn't let them go to the local ice cream parlor because there was a colored window and a white window and they didn't want their kids, you know, 
in that culture. And so they always had homemade ice cream. And just the kind of joy that that memory of McDonald's had for this woman, you know, these are the things that are so um, fascinating to me. I had originally set out to write a book about civil rights and restaurants. And the reason why was because I was reading so many memoirs of people who had been involved in the civil rights struggle, and they always remembered going to an integrated restaurant or going to a sit down facility for the first time because they were so outside of that system. You know, um, Melba Patillo Beals talks about how embarrassed she was that when Thurgood Marshall came to Little Rock, Arkansas, there was nowhere he could eat and he had to go to some greasy hamburger place. John Lewis um, gave a talk at Georgetown a few years ago and he talks about eating Chinese food the day before um, the March on Washington. You know, this guy from Alabama and it was so different. And I thought how poignant it is that people remember these meals. And I found that people had those experiences of McDonald's, not because the quality of the food was overwhelming overwhelming, but it was one of the ways that people felt like they belonged. And um, those stories were um, incredible. And the last thing I will say about archives, going to the Paley Center in New York City and spending the entire day watching McDonald's cartoons from my childhood, I was like an emotional wreck at the end of the day. And no matter how much I want to think that I'm smarter than the advertisers, that I can analyze my way out of understanding the different market manipulation tricks to make me want McDonald's. Watching McDonald's commercial from when I was eight or nine years old always brings me to a place on how um, how these, these symbols matter. And um, the last plug I will put in, there's an unofficial McDonald's museum in San Bernardino, California. It is bananas. And the only rule, it's, it's an archivist nightmare. The only rule of this place is that if you donate something, you put your name on it and you can return it and take it back. And people from all over the world donate pie sleeves and uniforms, pictures, old McDonald's, you know, uh, jelly glasses from the Olympics, old Muppets, Happy Meals toys. I mean, it is, there's like no, um, there's no like waterproofing at any day, all of this material could um, go away. But um, this was a labor of love of a third generation Japanese American who said that fast food um, was one of the most important parts of his life um, in feeling like an American. And so he maintains this museum. And so when things open up, I highly recommend the unofficial McDonald's Museum in San Bernardino, California. Thank you, Dr. Chattel. And that was wonderful. And I love ending on that note. I will say in reading the book, when I heard about that, archive, I'm like, oh, I need to go to San Bernardino. That sounds fascinating. Bring some acid-free boxes and a cataloging system. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for spending the evening with us. And also thanks yeah. to those of you who attended tonight. A recording of the event will be made available on our YouTube channel and shared on social media. A link to purchase franchises in the chat. I'd also like to draw your attention to an upcoming event that may be of interest. The event is Dedication, Determination, and Discipline, a conversation with Dr. Samson Davis. Dr. Davis is a celebrated African-American ER physician, and he'll be discussing his most recent book, Living and Dying in Brick City, Stories from the Front Lines of an Inner City ER. The event is organized by the VCU Division for Health Science Diversity and co-sponsored by the VCU Libraries and several other VCU units and organizations. Additionally, to make room for people of color to speak, share their experience, and help us celebrate their communities, the Friends of the Library Board developed a series entitled In Conversation, Nourishing Community Transformation. The series features speakers from the Richmond community discussing social justice, innovation, health, and development in the greater Richmond area. To learn more about these events and to suggest speakers, please get in touch with our development office the link should be in the chat. To find out about more about this event and other VCU library programs, please visit us at go.vcu.edu slash LIB events. Thank you for spending your evening with us and good night. <laughs>